All right, we're on live cook with me. Now, if you're watching this on the replay, I wanna let you know a couple things. First off is if you wanna make sure that you are here live and you wanna know when these live streams are happening, I do the live cook with me's on the first Thursday of every month, so that's the schedule for that. And also make sure you have your notifications turned on because I think, you know, for any channel that you want to make sure you're there when they're live, if I'm one of those for you, then having notifications on is a great thing because then you'll be notified when I am live so you can be here when these happen in real time. Um, now, if you want to skip ahead and from this intro part where I'm just be waiting for people to get here, feel free to do that. You can hang out here while I'm waiting for people to get here too. That's totally fine. But with that said, I'm going to see who's showing up and get us set up and ready to go. So if you're here live as you're coming on, just say hello, maybe where you're watching from or how your day is doing. I am going to um, get the video pulled up here on my tablet. Oh, Lauren Goes Hollywood says, hello. Hi, Lauren. I hope you're having a good day today. It's starting to get a little rainy outside here, so I'm hoping that we don't have like a major storm and lose power, um, but I'm going to try to get the video pulled up here on my tablet so I can see your comments when I start chopping and stuff. And once we get some more people on here, we'll get started with making dinner. And for dinner tonight, we're going to be making a frittata, which is one of my favorite meals. So I thought it'd be fun to show you how I do it. Turn down the volume on this. Get that going. Okay, perfect. So now I'll be able to... Oh, I want the live chat. There we go. Okay. Um, oh, we've got some more comments coming in. So, Cows Healthy Eats says hi from the UK. Hi, nice to see you. Um, and also, um, I would like to know from you guys that are here live, uh, how did you find out about it? Because I know this week we're doing it different. We, you know, usually I do it the first Thursday, but it's the second Thursday this month. So did you see the video um, from last week? Did you just get the notification? I, I always like to know, maybe you saw it on Instagram. I always like to know how you guys are finding out um, so that you can be here right when it starts. Uh, Nita says, hi, Sarah, how are you? I'm doing well, Nita, how are you doing? I hope you're having a good day. We're getting ready to make some yummy food and I'm very excited for it. Lauren got a notification, perfect, good to know. See those notifications, they work. Um, which is also good to know because sometimes people say that their notifications aren't working. Uh, but Lauren also saw the video last week. Um, Cal also got a notification. Evie's number one says, hello, hello, how are you doing? I hope you're having a good, um, day or evening, I want to say that you are overseas, not in the U.S., if I'm remembering correctly. I try to remember everything, but I might be getting that wrong. Uh, Nita got the notification, saw the video. Casey Cakes, uh, hi Casey, also got notification. Evie got a notification. Okay, so y'all have your notifications on and you're rocking with it. That's good. Okay, so we're going to get started with food. I just realized I have to wet this paper towel because we're working with the mushrooms. I try to have everything prepped and ready to go, but I inevitably forget something. Um, yes, Evie's in the Netherlands. Okay, good. That's what I that's what I thought, but I wasn't sure if I was right or not. Okay, so we're doing frittata tonight, and the first thing we have to do is make some filling for the frittata. Um, oh, Evie's about to go to bed. Well, definitely get your sleep. You can always watch on the replay, but I love having you here live. Um, and Lauren says, oh, the mushrooms for your husband. Yes, Jason loves mushrooms, so I try to work them into the meals. So we're doing frittata. We gotta get the stuff to go inside it ready first, though. So we're gonna be doing a couple different roasted vegetables. Um, and also, one of the cats is playing down the hall, so if you hear like a ball rolling around sound, that's what's happening. I don't know if you can hear it or not. But we're going to be working on getting veggies done. I have a couple different things here for us to do, and I'm going to take you through the whole thing. So the first thing we're going to put in our frittata is some squash. So I did prep this ahead of time just because I didn't think y'all would want to sit here and watch me peel an acorn squash. Oh, Pornji is having a blast in the hallway right now. So I didn't think y'all would want to see me prep an acorn squash and peel it and do all that because it does take a little bit of time. Um, but so this was just an acorn squash. You could use any kind of squash or, you know, sweet potato would work too, I imagine. Uh, I just cut it in half, scooped out the seeds, peeled it, cubed it up. So we've got that. That's our first vegetable. I'm going to go ahead and toss this on a pan and we will get going. And for whatever reason, your comments aren't bumping up on my screen. Um, okay, so we've got that. The next thing we're going to do is mushrooms. So I've got this big container of mushrooms here. We're going to do all of these. So I'm going to start cleaning these and then I can answer your questions and chat. If you have questions about cooking stuff, if you have questions about nutrition stuff, if you just want to know like 
I don't know, what's my favorite mascara or something? We can do that too. Actually, I just realized I need to get some water. So I'm going to do that. If you have questions, put them in the chat and we will get going on cleaning these mushrooms. Also, if you feel so inclined, water reminders would be great for me because y'all know I just get talking and then I forget. And then my voice starts to sound all scratchy and weird. Um, okay, so clean mushrooms. For cleaning mushrooms, you want to use a damp cloth or paper towel because if you wash them like in water, they kind of get soggy and stuff. So, And plus they're not that dirty, so we're just going to give them a nice wipe down. So Evie's number one says, a little off topic, do you make breakfast burritos? I don't actually. Um, not, I don't even know if I've ever really had a breakfast burrito. Like it's one of those things that's out, like I think I would like it. I like all the things that go in it, um, but I don't typically make those. No, but that is a great option if you like breakfast burritos for the morning if you want something savory. I've also seen where people have kind of prepped them ahead of time, uh, pop them in the freezer in like little sealable bags and then uh, you can pop them out the night before to thaw or heat them up in the microwave so it kind of makes nice. If you want a quick breakfast uh, that you don't have to take all the time to prepare in the morning, but you also want something that's a little more savory or something that's a little more substantial, that can be a good option. Uh, let's see. Nita says, did you prep that during the weekend or did you do it before the live stream? I did it before the live stream. I did it about an hour ago and I had a little spare time. Um, I don't know how, you could, you could do it a couple days in advance. That's the other thing about this meal too I wanted to talk to you all about is, you know, I'm doing these veggies right now, like right before I make the frittata, but you could definitely, you know, especially if you like to do meal prep because you don't have time to cook in the evenings or you don't feel like cooking when you get home from work or school or whatever, um, you could prep a bunch of roasted veggies on the weekend to use in various meals and this could be one of the meals that you use them for or if you roast the vegetables for dinner one night you can make a little extra or maybe you just have some leftovers for whatever reason you know frittata is a great kind of catch-all meal to just use whatever little bits of extra veggies or whatever you have lying around i typically plan mine out what i want to have in it but you can also just use it to get rid of stuff that's about to go bad or on those nights where you're like uh i don't know what to make i didn't plan for this or i have less time than i thought you know just grabbing whatever things you have and throwing it in a frittata is a really good way to go okay um Evie, talking about breakfast brew, says, I hear about them, but when looking up how to make, it contains some kind of sausage we don't have here, cheeses we don't have here, any tips, would love to try. Well, I don't know what specifically you have in the Netherlands and don't have, but really, it can be anything you want to put in there. I mean, you could do eggs, I think is kind of a classic one. You could put beans in there. Um, I think salsa's good. Whatever kind of cheese you like, really, I don't think it matters really too much. It's whatever you're kind of enjoying if you want to do cheese um whatever vegetables i mean you could saute up peppers or onions or spinach would probably work really well um if you had some tomatoes what else if y'all have any other ideas or if you are a breakfast burrito aficionado let us know um in the chat because that would be helpful uh but those are kind of my ideas off the top of my head I'm trying to think if there's anything else Ooh, like green onions that could be good yeah and of course any spices. Um, Lauren Goes Hollywood says, so I know people who peel mushrooms. Do you think that's necessary? Lauren, honestly, I have never heard of anyone peeling a mushroom and I'm not sure what the purpose would be. Maybe there are certain varieties where that's a good thing to do. I have no, I, I've, that's not something I've ever heard of. So I don't know why they would do it. It's not necessary to do. Um, so yeah, sorry I don't have more details on that, but I've never heard of that before. Uh, Nita says, how much does nutrition help with different medical conditions like autoimmune diseases? Um, as far as nutrition's impact on different conditions, it really varies from condition to condition. Uh, you know, something like type 1 diabetes is an example of an autoimmune condition um, where nutrition has a big impact because for those people, you know, their body isn't making insulin, so they need to count their carbohydrates, dose their insulin correctly to match the carbohydrates that they're eating and all that stuff. So nutrition plays a big role in that. Um, but for something else, it might not play a big role at all. So it really depends on the condition. Um, 
And, you know, so the, and also from condition to condition, we may know more or less about it and how much uh, nutrition can make a difference if it's a condition that we don't know as much about. It could be less clear. So some things that might not have any impact at all, sometimes it could really help. And I think that's something that's important to know because uh, I made a video about this recently, um, if y'all saw it, about, you know, this idea of food as medicine, which I can get down with, I kind of understand it and like, you know, that food is a part of what impacts our health and it can make a difference and we don't want to ignore that when we're thinking about people's health because that does happen sometimes when people, you know, maybe go to the doctor, their lifestyle stuff isn't considered and I think we could put movement in there and sleep and stress and all those kinds of things that really can impact the way you're feeling um, and way, the way things are going and sometimes that isn't, you don't get that Maybe when you go to your doctor, that's not something they pay attention to. Though I do think some doctors are getting better and better about that, which is great. Um, but at the same time, there's also this kind of idea of like food as this magical cure that can solve all of our problems. And oh, don't get those medications that your doctor said you needed. Just drink this smoothie and you'll be cured. Um, so nutrition can't help with everything. Uh, but, you know, for each specific thing, it's something that's worthwhile to look into because it might be able to help. Let me know if you have anything more specific on that. Um, oh, Evie gave me a water reminder. Thanks, Evie. Love ya. Okay. I'm gonna... I'm gonna move this to the side. So, we'll keep doing questions, but I'm gonna cut up mushrooms now. So, I'm gonna turn the camera facing down so y'all can see my chopping. Um, if you need some chopping tips or wondering how I'm gonna cut up these mushrooms. And I will keep chatting um, while we do this. So... Let me get this, try to get this angled right. So y'all can see what's happening. There we go. I think that's pretty good. Yeah, I've got the space here where I can chop. Okay, so what I'm gonna do with these mushrooms, I'll tell you real quick and then we will get back to work. P.S. This is the knife I'm using. Sometimes people ask about kitchen tools. So this is the global um, one of their like chef's knives. If you want to see the specific one, I do have a link to my Amazon store in the description of the video. So that has a lot of stuff that I like, different tools, different food items, just books, all kinds of stuff. So if you want to see this knife or any of that other stuff that's linked below the video, you can go over and check that out. And it is also a way to support the channel if you uh, buy things on Amazon through my links because you pay the same price, but Amazon gives me a little percentage for sending you over there. So if you want to support this work and you've gotten value from it, then that's that's a way you can do that. So that aside, this is the knife. We're cutting up mushrooms. So I'm just quartering these because that's about the size that I want. And when these roast, they are going to shrink down a lot. So we're just going to go like that. Um, and some of these, the bigger ones, I'll probably have to cut into six. And then the smaller ones, I'll quarter. The main thing is we want these to be all about the same size so that they will cook at the same rate. Okay, back to questions while I chop. Let me scroll over here on the side. Um, oh. Cal says that uh, they usually make a frittata with, I'm guessing, or breakfast burrito. One, it could work for both, so I'm not sure. But they usually make one with the little bits left, o left over at the end of the week in the fridge. I think that's a great idea. Um, and Evie's number one says, Mother's Day is here uh, this coming Sunday the 13th. When do you celebrate that? Yes, we also have Mother's Day coming up on Sunday. Um, here, which I know, at least I want to say in England, they celebrate it earlier in the year, but I don't know about other countries and when they have Mother's Day and like how many do it at that time versus now. So at least we know the Netherlands does it at the same time as the US, thanks to Evie. Um, if any of you live in another country that has Mother's Day on a different day, let us know. I always think that kind of stuff is super interesting. Um, Marie says hello from Richmond, Virginia. Hi, Marie. It's good to see another Virginia person is here besides myself. Uh, Lauren Goes Hollywood says hi. Oh, and Cal is in the UK. Okay. Oh, Lauren says Germany as well. Uh, we're always the second Sunday in May. Okay, so we've got Germany, the Netherlands, and the U.S. All in the same Mother's Day boat. Okay, now I've got the large mushrooms here left. So I'm going to cut these into sixths instead of quarters. 
And as was mentioned earlier in the chat, my husband Jason is a big fan of mushrooms. I'm just kind of, meh, they're fine. Uh, but I've been trying to do, probably within the past six months, incorporating them more into the meals because it's something that I don't usually think about and I realize, you know, we should have mushrooms more often because Jason really likes those. <laughs> um, so frittata is a really good way to do that. All right, and this is the last kind of giant one here. Okay, mushrooms are chopped. Now I'm gonna turn the camera to, there we go, the face facing me again, and we will get to working on these mushrooms. And this is always the struggle too when I change. Oh, the oven's preheated, good. Getting this kind of semi lined up. Okay, we're pretty good. Okay, so now I'm gonna get these mushrooms on a baking sheet as well. Let's put them, I'm gonna put them on this one. Um. Oh, Evie's number one says, I love mushrooms. So rest, if a recipe calls for small sliced mushrooms, I kind of ignore that. We love mushrooms, so we want to taste those. Makes sense. Yeah, and that's the thing too, you know, the size and shape and the way you cut stuff up can definitely make a difference. So if something isn't your favorite, but you'd like to practice it a little bit and maybe try to develop a taste for it, smaller might be better. If you really want it to be apparent, then, you know, you can do bigger pieces. Okay. So I've almost got all the mushrooms on here and I'm thinking with the amount of mushroom that these mushrooms are just probably gonna take up their whole own pan. Oh, sorry, when I do my hand that way, I'm covering the camera, I will try not to do that. Um, Nita says, I thought the stem of the mushroom was woody and shouldn't be used. Uh, I usually keep them in there. I think they taste fine. You could cut them off if you wanted to. Sometimes if the ends look a little rough, I'll trim those off, like the little end nubbin, uh, but I always cook with them. And I think they're fine, but you know, you do you. If you don't like them, you ain't gotta eat them. Put them in your compost. Excuse me, I'm burping. Put them in your compost. Or another good thing you can do with veggie scraps is keep a like zip top bag in your freezer. And then any sort of scraps that would be good to go in broth, just keep that bag in there. So little ends of celery, little ends of carrot, ends of onions, ends of your mushrooms. If you have like some parsley or some thyme that's about to go bad, throw it in there. And then when you are gonna make some broth, uh, whether that's veggie broth, you're making a chicken broth, beef broth, whatever, you can just throw those veggies in instead of like getting a whole new carrot out. So it helps reduce your food waste. Um, which is really cool, I think. All right, so we got the mushrooms on here. Next thing, I have a couple red onions that I popped in the freezer. I'm gonna go rinse my hands off and grab those, and we'll talk about why those are in the freezer uh, while I cut them up. I've got mushroom stuff all over my hands. Okay. So I popped these in the freezer before I started because that helps so they don't make you cry. I guess it freezes, you know, they're not frozen, but it helps so that whatever that compound is that interacts with your eyes and makes them watery, it's a lot less of an issue. You can also, um, another tip is if you forget to put them in the freezer, well, you can wear goggles, like swim goggles or you can get onion goggles, but also when you cut it, put the cut, put some vinegar on your cutting board and dip the cut side in the vinegar and that also helps neutralize that stuff that makes your eyes burn, so. I find red onions are particularly bad for that and you know, especially on a live stream, I'm not trying to be crying, so. Okay, so we've got the onions, I'm gonna cut these up. I'll turn y'all facing back down so um, you can see that if you wanna see how I'm gonna cut the onions. Okay, there we go. That seems pretty good. And I will also catch up on comments while we do this. Oh, talking more about mushrooms. So, Evie's number one says, I usually remove a little of the stem. Shiitake mushrooms are kind of harder. I normally don't really cut the stem. Okay. And Evie also says, a food waste saver, the stem of broccoli. A lot of people toss them. You can eat them. Uh, you could peel them if you wanted to. Yeah, that's true. A lot of things that you could use, people just end up throwing away. So broccoli stems are a good example of that. And when you get like broccoli slaw at the store, that's what that is, broccoli stems. So you could even shred it up if you wanted to. Um, okay, let's do onions. And then we'll talk a little bit and then I'll get back to your comments. So with the onion, the big thing with anything like this that can roll around is you want to make it stable for yourself. And also when we're cutting up anything, we want to have nice even pieces. So when we're cut our onion, the first thing we're gonna do is cut the top off. And then we are going to cut it in half. Okay, so 
And now this is giving us our staple surface. And if you had the vinegar, you would dip this side in the vinegar. So we're gonna peel off this outer layer of onion. And this is an example of something, as long as obviously it's not rotten or anything, that can go in your compost bag in your freezer. So now we've got that little half. We're gonna do the same with this one. Sorry, might be better if I peeled this in front of you. I don't know. I hate when onions have like the really thin papery skins. It's always a little bit of a pain. Okay, so now that we have our onion, uh, you can do a few different things. Um, if you wanted to dice it, you would slice it this way and then slice down this way and cut across. Some of y'all have seen me do that on other live streams. But today I'm cutting this into wedges to roast. So what I'm actually gonna do is cut off the end bit here and then I'm gonna cut this into nice even chunks and try not to cut my finger off. See, this last part is a little bit challenging because it's kind of unstable. Okay, so there we go. And then we're gonna do the same on this piece. Cut the end off and then we will go around and get that chopped. And then we're gonna do the same thing on the other one. And while I do that, I will look at more of what y'all are saying in the comments. Um, okay, Lauren Goes Hollywood says, do you think eating raw veggies is necessary for health. I pretty much can't eat raw veggies at all. I always get stomach cramps. Um, I mean, just in general, I think it's a good idea to have some raw and some cooked vegetables, generally speaking, uh, because some nutrients are enhanced by cooking, some nutrients are damaged by cooking. So if you have a mixture, then you're getting a mixture of you know that situation. So you might be getting more of some nutrients, less of others, depending on which way you have it. Uh, but also, you know, it's nice to have variety in our textures and flavors when we have foods, it's just for our overall enjoyment. But uh, you know, cooking does help kind of break down the fiber a little bit and makes things easier to digest. So sometimes people who have GI issues do you find that they can't really tolerate raw vegetables very well and they're better off cooking them. Uh, so that might be the case for you. I'm going to turn this up. And just as a reminder, oh, there we go. On any of these live streams, of course, this is all general advice. It's not here to diagnose or treat any sort of medical condition or anything like that. You always want to talk to your doctor about anything or your dietitian, anything like this. Um, but generally speaking, that is a thing that can happen. So maybe if you're having trouble with that, it might be a good idea to just go in, see your doctor, if you have a GI doctor, um, go see them and just say, hey, this is something I've noticed. Um, because especially if you wanna eat raw veggies and you're like, man, this is annoying, I wanna eat these foods and I'm having trouble with it. Uh, that could be something to go in and talk about just to get a checkup and see if maybe there's something going on um, or maybe something that can be done to help with that. Uh, and it might just be, yeah, those foods don't really work for you, but it might be, oh yeah, we could do X, Y, Z, and then you can have those things and not have to, you know, not be able to enjoy them. Okay, we've got our onion done. Now I'm going to give you all a little rotation so you can see what's happening over here. There we go. So we have our butternuts or acorn squash here. We have our mushrooms here. I'm gonna go ahead and throw the onions on with the butternut squash because there's less of that than there is the mushrooms. And the big thing with roasting, as I have told y'all many times, is you don't wanna overcrowd your, overcrowd your pan because if you do that, then uh, things won't roast, they will start to steam, which isn't a problem, but the flavor is gonna be different. Um, you're not gonna get that nice caramelization and concentration of the flavors with if it starts steaming as you would if it was roasting. So you wanna make sure it's a nice even layer. You just don't want stuff piled up. Uh, so we're gonna give the mushrooms their own pan over here. And now we're gonna season everything. So you can do whatever you want with this. We're just gonna do a few basic things. So we're gonna do some salt, because that's always great for enhancing flavor. And I don't measure anything unless I have a recipe that says put this much on. So I'm just sprinkling. Um, because I like recipes, but most of my cooking, as y'all see on these things, it's just me doing stuff, making stuff up. Thank you, Evie, for the water reminder. All right, we got our salt on there. I'm gonna put on also a little garlic powder. Not required, but it definitely adds another boost of flavor. So I'm just gonna sprinkle that on everything. 
And I use this all the time because it's just such an easy thing. It doesn't take any extra work. It's not like something that's super crazy expensive, um, but it adds a ton of flavor, which is always good. We want our food to taste good. That's important. Okay, then we're gonna put on some sort of cooking fat. You can use whatever you want. I'm using olive oil, so I'm gonna do a little drizzle drizzle of this. And this is important to help with the roasting, uh, to keep stuff from sticking to the pan, all of that kind of stuff. And now that we've got that on there, I'm gonna actually stack the mushrooms up here real quick so y'all can see. I'm just gonna toss everything. So we're just trying to get things evenly coated here so that, you know, that salt and the garlic powder and the oil and everything is all getting moved around. And then we are going to just push things around so we have a nice even arrangement. We don't want stuff, again, to be piled up on top of each other. So I'm just making sure it's nice and even. I'm trying to get these little cut sides of the mushroom down on the pan so that that, you know, we're getting maximum contact with the pan because that's going to give us that browning, that caramelization that is going to give us pretty color and also give us great flavor. Okay, so looks like we've got kind of everyone arranged there. And then we're going to do the same with this. But before I do that, I did see, I know I've missed a few things, um, but I did see something specific about roasting. Uh, Lauren Goes Hollywood says, I've never had roasted veggies in my life. Um, it's putting this arrow in front of your thing. Let me look over here. It's like the, look, there's more. I'm like, okay, well, I can't see. What's being said? And this is not updating. What is going on, you guys? Technical difficulties. Here we go. I've never had roasted veggies in my life. I need to try that. You should definitely try it. It's my, probably my favorite way to cook any veggies. Um, just because it works for pretty much everything and it's simple, you know? It's not some super complicated process. You just cut everything up, you put it on a pan, you can be as creative as you want with the spices and herbs and all that kind of stuff, or you can just uh, do salt and oil and leave it at that. So it's really fun. And even with the same vegetable, it can be a little bit different if you do switch up the herbs or spices that you use. Um, and yeah, it, it, it makes, it works for pretty much everything and it makes everything taste really good. So I highly recommend. Um, also, Oven is preheated to 425, 400, 425 Fahrenheit, whatever that works, uh, which 400 Fahrenheit I want to say is like 200 Celsius if memory serves. That could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, and we're going to roast these for about 30 minutes. If it was something more delicate, like, I don't know, asparagus, maybe go a little shorter, uh, but 30 is going to be about right for these. So I'm going to wash the oil off my hands and then we will pop these in the oven and get to work on our other stuff. Okay. So, try not to burn my eyelashes off when the oven opens. We'll put these in here. Yeah, roasting pretty much works for everything except like lettuce. It wouldn't really work for that. But most of the veggies are good with roasting. And yeah, we're gonna do these for 30 minutes. And that should be uh, almost there. There we go. That should be right. Okay. So let me clean up my area a little bit and we're going to move on to our veggie because we have veggies in the frittata, but we're going to do another veggie to go with it. And I will show you what that is. So I get all this stuff off my hands. Okay. And I will also answer more of your comments and questions and remember to drink water. All right, let me see what I have missed real quick, and then we'll get into our next step. Come on, thing, rotate. There we go. Okay. Bum, 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 bum. What did I miss? Um, Evie says sometimes uh, she has trouble with the onion peeling, so they just take off the first layer. I've definitely done that myself as well. Um, and you can just put that, again, in your uh, freezer bag for your stock or your broth or whatever you want to call it. Nita is a fan of the roasted veggies. Tallvish says, hello, hello, how are you doing? I hope you're doing well. Um, oh, Evie and Lauren are talking about uh, 
roasting veggies and food cooking food and stuff Evie says same here as far as never having the roasted veggies and that in the Netherlands you basically just boil everything to death or deep fry everything <laughs> at least that's the typical Dutch food yeah roasting I feel like has become very popular probably in the past 10 years at least here in the US uh, but now it's my favorite way to do anything and it's great again if you don't have a lot of time because you can just prep that stuff at the beginning of the week um, if you want to do meal prep and then it's just in your fridge ready to go and you can see I mean we're gonna be cooking other things because we're making this meal but if you just wanted to get some veggies roasted to have in your fridge you just chop that stuff up put it in the oven and then you can walk away and do other things and then just come back when it's done so you do have to chop everything up, of course, but as far as cooking goes, it's one of the least time intensive ones because you don't have to babysit it like you do if you're sauteing something on the stove top or whatever. Um, okay, other comments. Let's see. Oh, Nita's asking about brands for things. So, um, do, 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 do. So, Salt, I've got the Himalayan pink salt. We've talked about this before on live streams, but you know, whatever salt you want to use is fine. I mean, this stuff, I like it. I think it's pretty, it's fun, it tastes good, whatever. But this isn't like some magical health secret or anything like that. If you just want to use regular table salt, that's fine. Use whatever you like, whatever fits within your budget, whatever is available, that's the bottom line there. This garlic powder is in a Simply Organic bottle, but this has not been simply organic garlic powder for a long time. I get this at a local grocery store, so it's kind of just like a little downtown shop that carries some local meat items and dairy and produce items and also some specialty items. And one thing they have is this whole wall of bulk spices. And it's awesome because everything is so much cheaper when you just buy the spice in bulk from these big jars as opposed to buying this bottle every single time. So I, I can just reuse this bottle, which is great. And also it's a lot cheaper and you can get the amount that you need. So if it is like a very specialty spice that you're, you're not gonna use, you know, you don't need a whole bottle of it. You can just get the amount that you want. I love that, that's great. And then olive oil, this is Cassandrino's olive oil. I think this stuff is really good. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. This is linked in my store too. So if you wanted to get it, um, you can find it there and you can get the bottles. I get, I got this bottle the first time I bought it and then I get the big tins uh, cause it's a little bit cheaper to buy it that way. And then I just refill my bottle. So that is there as well. Okay. Um, Kenny has lava salt, which I've never heard of. Um, and Evie says, by the way, if you replay the live stream on your computer, you can play the chat like we're doing now. Yes, I know that is a new update, which y'all can tell me. I mean, y'all are here live, but if you're watching on the live stream, um, because this is kind of a pretty recent change. Do you just watch the chat? Is it okay if I don't read the comments now? Are you fine with that? Do you like me reading the comments? Because otherwise it feels a little weird to me just be like, oh, haha, -ha, good one, Evie, you know, or something because I'm so used to reading the comments. But maybe that's not necessary. It's whatever y'all like, really. So if you like me reading it, let me know if you'd prefer I didn't because you're like, Sarah, we know what they said. Stop telling us. That works too. <laughs> I don't have a strong preference. It's just whatever is most helpful. So let me know what you think. Um, okay, Nita asks, is there a nutritional difference between salts and seasonings? Um... Not, it's just whatever specifically you're using. I mean, spices and herbs and stuff don't offer a lot in the way of like vitamins and minerals because uh, you're using small amounts and you know, especially with spices, they're like barks and things. I, you know, it's not like eating any other food really because it's just a little thing to add a little dash. But they do have phytochemicals. So those are, you know, all the things that make them different colors and little things going on. They don't classify as a vitamin or a mineral, but they could potentially have health benefits or whatever. Um, so it really depends on thing to thing. Um, and then as far as salt, really the only thing there is just sodium. Uh, you know, if you are someone who has a medical condition where you have to watch your sodium or something like that, then that's something to be aware of. Uh, but that would be the only real difference between anything is if it has salt added to it which is a good thing to know because you know if this had salt in it then I of course would not need to add this and if I did then it would probably taste gross because it'd be way too salty um oh Evie says that their uncle works in a salt factory there are a lot of types some combinations different stuff in it really depend depends from brand to brand um yeah and also you know 
table salt in the United States at least is iodized, meaning iodine is adding in, which can be good to prevent iodine deficiency, which can cause a goiter, which is like when your thyroid swells up and you get this mass in your neck. You can look up pictures of goiter on the internet and see. That was starting to become an issue in the US at least, because people weren't getting enough iodine, especially in the center of the country back in the day, because iodine, one of the major sources is seafoods and sea vegetables. So if you live in the middle of the United States and you're landlocked and you don't have a lot of natural sources of iodine in your diet, it's quite possible to develop a goiter. And of course it can happen lots of places if people aren't getting their iodine. So that's when our salt started to be iodized to put that iodine in there because everyone uses salt because you know you use it to season things when you're cooking it's like this is a great way to make sure make sure people are getting their iodine so that is uh, another thing like this salt no iodine added so you know I eat seafood and seaweed and stuff so I don't have a problem but if someone didn't have access to those things then it could be so that's another thing um Kenny said uh, he was told that the darker the salt, the better it is. Is that true? I wouldn't say that's true. I mean, with any of these salts, you are getting trace minerals and things that are making it pink and all that kind of stuff that you don't get with refined table salt. But it's not in some huge amount that's going to like make a remarkable difference for your health or really have any impact. Uh, so I think the most important things are flavor so you know some of these salts different salts might taste a little different that can be fun um and also you know what you can find and what's in your budget if you are on a tight budget and you're trying to figure out where to spend your food dollars to maybe um you know make some changes that could help with improve your health or just overall get a better balance of different foods the salt is not where you want to spend your money. You want to spend it on getting more produce items or maybe looking at higher quality meats potentially or higher quality eggs or something like that um, rather than your salt. And then also if, if you got to drive a million miles just to find salt, don't, don't worry about it. I mean, I think there are more options even in more remote areas and stuff now and in smaller grocery stores and less fancy grocery stores and stuff like that. But still, you know, if it's going to be some sort of trek, it's not worth it unless you're like, this is the best tasting thing ever and it's like your personal obsession, then maybe it's worth it to you. But overall, not really worth it. Um, choo -choo 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 -choo. Okay, I need to get another drink of water. And then we're going to start working on some more cooking stuff because if I keep talking, the roasted vegetables are going to be done and we're not going to have anything else, else ready to go. Okay, Nita says that she likes me reading the comments because we might miss a comment because we're looking at the video. That's true. Oh, Evie signing off. Time for bed. Love meeting you all. Love watching the videos and Jason's videos. If you didn't know, my husband Jason does have a channel called Cats and Pats. It's all about cats and tips for cat owners. So that's fun if you want to watch that. Um, I'm glad you're liking the videos, Evie. Uh, Evie says, have a nice dinner. Good evening. Good night to you. Sweet dreams. Um... Lauren says she agrees, she thinks it's better if you still address the comments so we know what you're referring to. Okay, that's helpful. Um, okay, Cal says hi from the UK. Ooh, Emily has a midterm in 20 minutes. Oh no, but exciting? I mean, good luck, I hope you do well. I know midterms are no fun, but I'm sure you'll do great and we're all rooting for you. And uh, when it's done, I bet you'll feel a lot better, hopefully. Um, Okay, then there's a couple comments that are going to take a little bit longer to answer. So we'll get into the next thing, and then I can talk about all that kind of questions that y'all are asking um, as we go. Okay, so next thing we're going to do is our vegetables. So we've got the mushrooms and the onions and the acorn squash roasting, but those are going to go in the frittata, and I want a veggie kind of on the plate, just something else to add some nice freshness. So we are going to do salad. I got these two heads of lettuce from my farmer's market. And we're going to chop these up and just do like a nice little side salad. Um, if you aren't following me on Instagram, definitely go over and do that. I shared, I always share a farmer's market haul um, every time I go. And these, if you did see that picture, were in there. And if you go look now, then you'll find them. Uh, but I thought these looked super tasty. And so we're going to chop these up and do our thing. So I am not going to turn the camera down because I think it's pretty simple and it's going to happen pretty quickly. But I'm just going to chop these across like this so real simple rough chop and then we're gonna wash the lettuce that's the big thing is the salad spinner if you're getting fresh lettuce that's not washed whether it's from your farmer's market or your grocery store you know the kind of heads of lettuce 
you gotta wash that stuff or there's gonna be grit and dirt and sand in your teeth. Not a great way to eat dinner. So, <laughs> um, I've got the salad spinner here and I just think this makes such a difference as far as making it so much easier. Also, come here, Mill. You wanna say hi to everyone? I've got this, this gentleman running around under my feet. Say hi, this is Moxie. He's being a little shy. Look at him, he's so cute. He has the prettiest markings. I just cannot get over. I always talk about how he has his eyeliner, his eyeliner on and his highlighter on. Just look at it's so cute. This is the first kitty we got. He's our little boy. Okay, I think he wants to get down. I'll put you down. All right, so lettuce cutting and questions. So Talvish had a question. They asked, is giving up sugar completely bad? I currently get my sugar intake from honey. Okay, so I actually have a video about quitting sugar. I'm not sure if you've seen it or not, but I would definitely recommend that one um, because it's going to probably be a lot more organized in what I say than me just spouting off live here. Uh, and, you know, you can kind of go back and watch it and it will be um, probably a little more detailed than what we're going to do right now. But, quickly, I do not recommend cutting out foods or eliminating foods and sugar is the same way. I know sugar is kind of like the nutritional boogeyman right now. It seems to be one of the ones that everyone just would be like, it's killing us all. Ah! You know, and you can find lots of documentaries about like sugar, it's poison. Da, da, da. And it's like all very dramatic. And you know, it's always a conspiracy also with a lot of those food documentaries. Not like food documentaries can be informative and documentaries in general can be good. But it seems like a lot of the food documentaries are very fear-mongering. Um, and just like, what I'm watching, I'm like, seriously? What is happening? This is ridiculous. Um, but, so, just wanna put that out there, because I do feel like that's kind of the current climate, is everyone's like, sugar, the worst thing ever. Um, I think I told, yeah, in the one video recently, I told y'all about how I had a woman at a health fair here recently she was one of the vendors next to me and who her whole board was about like the secret things hiding in our food and it was like very scary and uh someone came up and she, like i guess she had something on her board about how sugar's the worst and she's like oh yeah i guess i do eat a lot of sugar it's pretty bad and i was like yeah i mean sugar cocaine it's basically the same thing and i was like what is happening <laughs> <laughs> like, am I the only one here right now that realizes that this, just, no, no, just stop. Um, so that's kind of the preface. You all know, I just keep talking and talking. I haven't even answered the question yet. I'm going to run this under some water and we'll talk about sugar some more. Okay, so is it the case that there are people um, in various places, the U.S. being one of them, that maybe have a more sugar than would be great for them, for their health. Yes, um, but that doesn't mean that sugar is poison or sugar is bad or we should never eat any sugar. Uh, sugar is, you know, it's carbs, our bodies digested, our bodies break down. And in the US at least, people get a lot of their sugar from soda. So if you're not drinking a ton of soda, um, you're likely, you know, not getting those huge numbers of sugar, of grams of sugar that people talk about. Because that is one of the major contributors. And because people, you know, can drink it so quickly and so easily and maybe aren't paying attention or being mindful about it, that's where a lot of people's sugar is coming from. Um, so sugar is not like this evil thing that's killing us all. Yes, having too much sugar isn't going to be great for you, but that's the same with anything, y'all. I mean, having too much of anything, not a good idea. We need variety in our diet. We need a lot of different foods to have a good mix of nutrients to make sure we're not overdoing anything as well, um, but also to help our food taste good and have, you know, enjoyable meals that has a variety of flavors and textures and colors and all that kind of stuff. So I think variety is really the key. And you know, desserts are nice. And part of life, I think, is enjoying your life and enjoying your food. And there's nothing wrong with a dessert. I enjoy desserts myself because um, they taste good. And that's all, you, you know, every food doesn't have to be some, like, nutritional powerhouse. It could just taste good and you like it. Um, also, a lot of people talk about how sugar, so you don't need to cut out sugar. Um, 
And I would not recommend it because when we do things like that, like cut out whole foods, what ends up happening is we end up in this like binge restrict cycle where we don't let ourselves have any of that food and then we end up binging on it later and eating a ton and we feel out of control. And if we go to a party and it's there, it's like this whole like thing. You hear people all the time saying, oh, that food is my weakness or I just can't be around it or I can't have XYZ food in the house or I'll eat the whole thing or whatever. That's because of restriction. So when you allow yourself to have all foods and you have full permission, then you don't uh, feel that kind of like, I can't control myself, I have to have it because when you um, when you can have it whenever, it's like you can actually tap into, does that sound good right now? Am I feeling that? Is that like something I want? And sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes the answer is no. You're also able to eat the amount that satisfies your taste buds because you don't have this kind of like, well, I haven't had any. Now I gotta eat as much as possible because now, who knows when I'll have this again. It sets up this whole cycle where we restrict and then we binge. And because we binge, then we restrict again, which leads to more binging and we just end up in this spiral. Um, also, I'm just judging the lettuce, by the way, right here. Also, as far as um, sugar being addictive, or being like cocaine, people will always say that. It's not, okay? Yes, sugar lights up these different like reward pathways in our brains. That doesn't mean it's addictive. We have those reward pathways in our brains for a reason. They're there to encourage us to engage in behaviors that are good for us or make us feel good or whatever. So, you know, those pathways light up when we eat because our body wants to encourage us to eat and to enjoy food because we need to eat to get the energy and the nutrients that we need. And especially if we are in an environment where we don't have consistent access to food, then our brain really wants to reward that behavior to make sure that it's happening. Um, but those are the same pathways that light up when you, I don't know, when you do exercise or when you pat a puppy or when you hug someone or whatever. These are all things that kind of make our brain go, oh, that's nice. We like that. Uh, that doesn't mean it's addictive. Uh, and really what's happening with something like cocaine or other drugs like that is that they are kind of hijacking those pathways in our brain. So the pathways are there. The pathways are not the problem. It's the drugs that are then hijacking that, overstimulating and creating this whole issue um, where then we feel like we need more of that thing. And, you know, with, and I think comparing sugar to drug addiction is just so insensitive on so many levels and illogical. Uh, but, you know, when people who have drug addictions, it can wreck their life. It does wreck their life. You know, it can get in the way of relationships. You know, you're not going to steal money from your best friend uh, to go buy a candy bar if you have enough food to eat whatever maybe you would steal money if you were food insecure but that's another thing but it's not like the sugar like I gotta get my sugar fix y'all and I'm gonna go steal $20 from my grandma because I gotta get that sugar also sugar from all foods would be the same so you would be like fruit would be irresistible as well or anything that had sugar it wouldn't matter what it was because I mean we see that with people with drug addictions they'll try to look for the drug anywhere any form they can get you hear about people with alcohol addiction you know looking for alcohol, not in alcoholic beverages, but other maybe products that contain alcohol, all that kind of stuff. Uh, that doesn't happen. People aren't taking their rent money and spending it on bananas because they're like, man, I got to get that sugar, <laughs> you know? But those are things that happen with drugs. So those are some of the differences. Um, something to think about. Okay. Let me see where I left off. Oh, comments about the kitties. Nita says that Moxie's beautiful. Um, did you know that Jason liked cats when you met him? Yes, I did. So, but we both grew up with cats. So, if, and we just like animals in general. So, uh, definitely something that we're both into. Uh, Lauren goes to Hollywood says, I think your video about not eating sugar and your experience of quitting sugar for a year in high school is really insightful. Thank you. That is the most popular video on my channel currently when we are having this chat, which is surprising to me. And I think it brings a lot of people in, which is interesting. It also has some of the most negative and I personally think hilarious comments. <laughs> I think one I got on the video was, your voice makes my ears bleed. And I was like, wow, that's, that's great. And another one made me laugh. Um, but for whatever reason, I think because the sugar stuff is such a big deal, people are really into that one. And it's not like my most to the point, here's the info, it's kind of me just rambling on. So it's kind of like, why did this have to become the most popular one? Because I think a lot of people say that that's the comment. There are a lot of comments about why don't I just stop talking? I'm like, well, you saw how long the video was and you're watching it. What did you expect me to just sit there silently? 
Uh, but yeah, my personal experience, that's a good point. I tried to cut out sweet foods and sugary foods in high school um, and it created a lot of issues. I mean, watch that video if you want to see the full story, but it just put me in this really unhealthy place, which was part of a bigger unhealthy place of me just engaging in disordered eating habits just in general, but that was kind of part of it. And Lauren says, yeah, um, don't drink your calories. Most liquids have a lot of sugar. It's easy to go over the recommended um, with one soda a day. Yeah, that's the thing. A lot of times, especially with beverages, people aren't really paying attention to it with soda. People aren't, like, drinking their soda a lot of times and savoring it or really tasting it. Like, for me, if I have a soda, like, I have a few sips, but then it's like, okay, that tasted good. I got. I'm not a big soda person either, so maybe I'm not the best example of this, but I'm not, like... I could go without a soda ever again and I'd probably be fine. I'm just not that into it. But uh, people, I think a lot of times are mindlessly drinking soda. They're just kind of like, just have their cup with their straw. They're just going, they're not even thinking about it or recognizing it as food or they're not having it as part of their meal. It's just kind of like this constant soda thing that's always happening. Um, so I, I think mindlessness is a big part of that. Okay, we've got the lettuce rinsed. I'm probably gonna have to do this a couple more times. Um, and I'm trying to figure out the best way to do this. I'm going to take this over to the sink and get the, maybe I could turn it. Uh, well, we're just going to see all of my dishes that are piled up. I don't know if that's something you want to see. Look, there's my sink and all of my dishes. Um, I'm, but I'm going to come over this way so I can still talk to y'all while I do this. Okay. You can kind of see me. This kind of works. So what I'm doing now is just straining out the lettuce. We'll probably have to do a couple rounds of washing uh just to get the grid out but we will see how this first round looks and then we can go from there and uh like i said the salad spinner is really a game changer with this sort of thing it just makes it so much easier to wash it and get it dry um, and it's one of those things this is also linked to my store if you want it uh this specific one i like it i think it works pretty well but um, it's one of those things that I kind of thought, oh, that's like an extra gadget. I don't need that. Uh, whatever. But once I got it, I found it in Target one day. Uh, and it was like one of those things like, buy this item, get a $10 Target gift card. And I was like, oh man, like, if I want to get one of these, I've been thinking about it. Like, this is the time. So Target got me with the, with the sale thing. But I bought it. And especially this time of year, like, when there's a lot of leafy green vegetables, lettuces, kales, Swiss chard, bok choy, whatever. We use this thing at least once a week, if not twice a week. Uh, so, I've, it's been well worth the money and I've definitely gotten gotten the value out of it. All right, I'm gonna dump this water. Sorry y'all, that's the thing about cooking streams is some of this stuff doesn't really lend itself to, uh, to doing on video, you know? Like right now I'm washing lettuce and we're like, I'm watching this girl wash lettuce right now? What is happening? Uh, but unfortunately, I'm not a cooking show, and I don't have people here to do things for me off camera. Well, that's not true. If Sometimes Jason is available uh, to be a helper. So I don't want to not acknowledge his contributions to the live streams. Okay. Let me know if y'all have any more questions or anything. I'm going to get some more water because I'm feeling like I've been talking a lot. We might have to do this two more times. I'm hoping we can get away with just two washes, but we might have to do three, just depending on how gritty it is. Um, but I find that three is typical. Especially with some bok choy, you really gotta do three times or it's not gonna happen because that seems to really hold the dirt. All right, I'm just gonna give this a little zhuzh here in the sink. Turn it on a little bit more. There we go, okay. Whew. Also, speaking of vegetables, uh, depending on where you are in the world, are y'all's farmer's markets open? Have y'all been going? Uh, what kinds of things have you been getting? Ours has just been open a couple weeks now, uh, but it's been nice so far. A little limited still this time of year, still a lot of plants. You know, if people wanna buy a pepper plant or a tomato plant to take home and put in their own garden or on their own patio or whatever. But there've been a few things like this lettuce. Okay. Let's get this strained. 
Nita just asked how much sugar is recommended. Um, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. It depends on your age and all that kind of stuff. And you got to remember that's added sugars. So that's not like the sugar that occurs in something like fruit that would be added in, uh, added cane sugar, added honey, maple syrup, that sort of stuff. Um, but with that said, I also would not recommend, you know, that y'all count your sugar or whatever, or that you count anything. Um, really, again, it's just about being mindful and paying attention and really trying to get that variety of foods. If you're getting variety and having a lot of different things and not, because a lot of times also the people who are getting a lot of sugar, it's because they're not eating a lot of different stuff. They're drinking a lot of soda or they're eating a lot of prepackaged baked goods or whatever, or maybe a lot of products that have extra sugar added in or whatever. A lot of low fat products that have had sugar added to uh, compensate for the fact that when you take the fat out, things don't taste great. <laughs> um, so things like that. Whereas if you're eating a wide variety of different foods, if you're doing a lot of cooking as well, um, but not necessarily, you can not cook and still have, you know, lower sugar. Um, that's really the thing. And so it's this one thing that's kind of like, oh, everyone's getting all the sugar, but it's like, well, is it the sugar or is it this broader thing of mindless eating, not having a lot of variety, also the way diet culture makes things like vegetables seem like sissy eat sissies eat vegetables or vegetables are gross or those are the foods you have to eat not the food you eat because you want to all those kinds of things start to actually get in the way of people making healthy food choices uh which they're intended to be like we need to eat healthier but all it does is like i go to health fair and i'm the dietitian and people look at my food and they're like oh the dietitian made that i bet that tastes gross and then i have to do this whole thing like just try some you might like it i wouldn't have it here if it tasted gross because I don't like to eat gross things, you know, and they're like, okay, and then they eat it, and they're like, this tastes good, and I'm like, yeah, it's just, it's just good tasting food, you know, so it gets kind of complicated with our psychology and the way we respond to things. Okay, I think two washes is going to be good on that. Now we can get back to a more normal setup here instead of me, like, leaning into the frame. Okay, we're going to blend up, well, not blend up, do the, uh, the salad spinner, so... For those of you who don't have a salad spinner, you just do this kind of like pumping thing and you can see all the water is spinning out. It's like magic. Alright, so we got that done. I'm just going to dump this water out of the bottom and then um, we'll just let this sit while we do the other stuff. Uh, Nita says, do dietitians have to know how to cook? Um, Yes and no. I mean, there are definitely some dietitians who are more into it than others. Like, a lot of what I know is just self-taught from me practicing in the kitchen, from me reading cookbooks, reading blogs, watching cooking shows, all that kind of stuff. But there is a good deal of cooking training in the education to become a dietitian. So, for those of you who want a little behind-the-scenes look of what it takes to become a dietitian, uh, as far as coursework, it is a mix of sciencey classes, things like organic chemistry and biochemistry and anatomy and physiology and microbiology and all of that kind of stuff, which is important to know. Um, then it's, so those are kind of like the hard, like core science classes. Then you have your nutrition specific science classes, uh, like human metabolism or your clinical classes that are about, you know, what kinds of dietary interventions are important for certain medical diagnosis and things like that. And then you have your cooking classes. So um, one of the classes we took was kind of just like a general cooking class. Each week was, so they're called like food labs. So we have a lab, you know, in the nutrition department that instead of being like the chemistry lab where you have beakers and Bunsen burners, oh, the veggies are done. Instead of having all that stuff, you have countertops and eight different ovens and microwaves and stove tops and knives and cutting boards and mixing bowls and all that kind of stuff. I'm gonna pull these uh, veggies out of here. Um, and so we take a variety of classes in there. So as I was saying, one class was kind of like a general cooking class. So that was one of the first classes, the, it was the first cooking class we had to take in our program. Sorry, I'm trying to get these veggies out of here. So. In that one, I'm gonna walk around. I'll be right back. I just gotta put this on the other side of the table and then I can talk in a more cohesive manner. 
because I will not be distracted by all this stuff. Okay, veggies are out. So, in that beginning cooking class, each week it was a particular food group that was featured. So like one week was fruit week, one week was vegetable week, one week was meats, one week was eggs, one week was grains, whatever. And then each of us had a lab partner, so we're in groups of two, and we were assigned a recipe. Um, our, our textbook for that class was this, the Better Homes and Gardens cookbook, <laughs> which I still keep on my bookshelf because it's a good source of just like, if I'm like, I need an apple pie recipe, you know, I'll look in here at least for a starter, you know, to kind of see what they say. Also, Jason just came in the door, so I won't require him to come over and say, hello on camera, but just so you know, if you hear him knock something over. Um, so yeah, so each week our, each group was assigned a different food item and then we got to uh, make our food in the food lab, make our recipe. And then we had to go through, uh, we all put our food out and we tasted everyone's food. And so then we got to talk about what did we think about this food? Did it taste good? Blah, blah, blah. Really, really fun. And you know, get to do some basic cooking skills. Then from that, there's all kinds of different cooking class. There's a quantity food class, which is like making foods in like a restaurant kitchen or something like that. So you get to use the big mixers and the big soup pots and like all that kind of stuff and learn the food safety stuff that needs to be involved and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's experimental foods, which is more about food science. So that's like if you wanted to work for a food company or maybe in recipe development or something like that, you learn about how different ingredients function in a food product. One of the first things we did was we're all going to make a batch of cookies here's a sugar cookie recipe group one is going to make it according to the recipe group two is going to take out the sugar group three is going to take out the baking soda or what group four is going to take out the salt so then we could lay out all the different variations and so you could really see what function that ingredient had in the recipe so then you can start to learn about how you might want to modify a recipe or you know tweak a recipe or make a new recipe and all that kind of stuff which is really fun so a lot of that stuff is making to our class and also a lot of people who are dietitians i mean they're there because they just love food so a lot of us just cooked a lot on our own okay if you have more questions let me know also nita says hi to you jason um okay oh <laughs> he's here um these mushrooms smell good yeah jason's gonna eat all the mushrooms i'm burping in he's gonna eat all the mushrooms before we even get it in the frittata Hey. Okay, and Lauren says that's so cool. I wish I knew how to cook. That's why I watch your videos. Oh, I'm glad that the videos ho hopefully they help with that. Um, so you know, uh, the uh, let's do some maintenance here. Um, I hope that the videos help with you with cooking. Jason, can yeah. you help me? Yeah. Uh, go on the live stream and um, uh, let's do this. Um, so, sorry y'all, when I get comments, I'm really bad about, cool. yeah, I'm really bad about dealing with it and not paying attention to it. It really distracts me, which is not good, because I need to not do that, because we're just rewarding the trolls. So if you can help me with reporting things, uh, that are just kind of spammy, or inappropriate, or aggressive, or, you know, yeah. we get all, all kinds around here. <laughs> the iPad died. Uh, yeah, the iPad died, so I can do it. Um, okay. We're gonna do the frittata part now. The veggies are out. Ooh, I did you show the new I did. He was walking around my ankles uh, earlier. Yeah, but you can show him again. I mean, he's very cute. Because he hasn't been able to walk very far. Been... Look at him. He's so precious. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to do eggs now. So we're doing a frittata. Eggs are a thing. Um, and I'm just going to crack them into this bowl. And we are doing 14 eggs. You could do a dozen. That, that works. I think it's a little bit better if you have like 14. 14? Just... That's how much is in one frittata? Yeah. Really? Like what we normally do? Yeah. Oh, I like used to eggs? I used to do like eight and do a smaller pan by starting. That's big... so many eggs. I had no idea. Yeah. But I mean, we always have a lot of left. Come here. Don't talk off camera if you're going to talk. Oh, sorry. Well, I need People can see nose. your cute face. I need to blow my nose first. Okay. We'll continue <laughs> this conversation when Jason comes back. I'm going to start cracking eggs. Um, uh. Nita asks, is there a difference between white and brown eggs? Brown eggs come from brown chickens. White eggs come from white chickens. That's the difference. Wait, really? Yeah. Nutrition. Are you serious? Yeah, the nutrition of the egg is just about what the chickens eat. I mean, there's chickens that that, that, that lay blue eggs and green eggs and pink eggs. Are they eggs. blue chickens? 
Um, yeah, kind of, some of them. I mean, uh, there's lots of different varieties. What is a joke? What? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like, they have some real pretty chickens. But it's really... The, so let's sure. go back to the num... What? Th that's how the eggs yes. work? Brown chickens lay brown eggs. White chickens lay white eggs. It has nothing to do with what they eat or how healthy or nutritious or whatever. It's just <laughs> different breeds lay different colors, just like some people have brown hair and some people have blonde hair. And I can't eat anything that's going to make my hair blonde or black or red or whatever. <laughs> um, I don't know. I have my doubts. Okay. Wait, wait, do, so do brown chickens only have brown chicken babies? I'm not sure about, I mean, chicken breeding is a thing, so I guess it would depend on who the father is as well. I mean, so you had two brown chickens. Will they only make a brown baby? I guess so. I'm not sure how chicken genetics work and as far as recessive genes yeah. and how those traits are passed on. But oh. generally speaking, you know, it would be based on the parents. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, y'all, there's like chicken shows, like a dog show, but like for chickens. We, we, we watched that People one get super the in. There's so many, yeah, there's so many breeds. It's really interesting. We had no idea. We have a friend that's doing uh, guinea pigs and, sorry, that's doing guinea pigs and gerbils and stuff, and she's been going to like gerbil shows. Yeah. And, like, showing all different gerbils and like, I have a, you know, a Canadian something something gerbil and like selling them off and I had no idea. And I guess it's the same with chickens. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so back to number for eggs in the... For oh, yeah, that's a lot of eggs. Yeah, well, but we always have a ton of leftovers, which is why I started doing this. I'm like, this doesn't take any more work, and it makes more food, which means I can have frittata for breakfast one day or one night where I'm like, hey, I don't feel like making dinner because that happens. Uh, more often than you might think, we have frittata in the fridge, which is always nice. And I see there's some more comments coming in, but I can't touch the screen right now because I've got egg oh. gunk all over my hand. I can touch it. I can get the iPad. Okay, the scroll a little bit, and then we'll go back to that one that you're... All right. Uh, uh, up. Up. No, other way down. Sorry. Hmm. I use my words, right? Fine. Keep Never going. Be... Keep going. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, Nita says she started you up talking. <laughs> um, oh, we have a new person first time here. We're doing a cooking live stream. I'm making a frittata right now. So if you want to see me make this, then, uh, that's what we're doing. Uh, and scroll back up to that other one. There was a long comment. Uh -huh. Unless you have any other thoughts before I get into a, a well, deeper Do you want question. me to set the iPad or not? Um, um, no, I guess we're fine. All right, Rai Rai's comment or above that? Yeah, Rai Rai. Okay. Do you want me to read it or you got it? Uh, yeah, you go ahead and read it and I will rinse off my fingers. <clears throat> Rai Rai says, I'm 22 years old and currently, ex uh, sorry, currently extremely overweight, but I'm very passionate in becoming an RD. Hopefully want to change and be able to help others. Do you have advice on, oh, do you have advice to watch my carb intake to lose weight? I'm excited that you want to become an RD. Is it yes um, what? Is it yes? Uh, on using that? Yeah, do you want to try it? No, it's no big deal. Right. This is fine. Um, I always like hearing from future RDs, so that's super exciting. We, and we have a few people, I don't know if we have anyone watching now, well maybe we do and they're just not commenting, which if you're one of those people, say hi, I want to hear from you. Um, but I understand if you're busy, if you're like, you know, curling your Exam hair time. or something, that's okay. Exam time. Exam time, that's true. Someone had a midterm coming up, which I'm not sure what their calendars. Sorry, I'm getting distracted. Focus, Sarah, focus. <laughs> so it's good to hear from you, future RD, um, and that's awesome. So good on that. Um, and like I said, there's other people in the Sarah Marie Nutrition community who are also like in school to be a dietitian, some people in their internships. So there's a lot of people here who are kind of in that thing, which I think is really cool. As far as weight loss and carb intake, I don't know if you've been around my channel for a while or how much stuff you've watched, but I wouldn't rec this is like a long question. I'd watch watch my video on intuitive eating. I think that is a good primer. Um so that will kind of give you an idea of what I kind of encourage people to do. It's also a book, Intuitive Eating. If you want to be an RD, I think that's a great book to read. Also, just so y'all can see, the eggs are in the bowl now. We've got them all broken up. I'm actually going to get a, uh, a fork and start whisking these while we chat. Um, okay, because we're doing cooking, but we're also doing Q&A. So, I don't recommend that people focus on weight loss. Um, that's not something I promote. There's a lot of reasons for that when we get into it. Um, the main, some of the main highlights though, high level, uh, are that one, uh, when we focus on 
weight, it doesn't necessarily promote healthy behavior. So a lot of times we get weight and health and we can feel the same thing. They're really not. Uh, we, uh, we can't look at the way someone looks and say what they're doing or what their health is like. Um, and a lot of times often focus on weight actually encourages unhealthy behaviors. So like restrictive dieting or over exercising or not going out for your friend's birthday because you don't know what's going to be at that restaurant or you're, it's not allowed on whatever diet plan you're following. Um, also it can, you know, dieting can start to push people into disordered eating and full blown eating disorders and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so what I actually encourage people to do is focus on healthy behaviors instead. So that's what you're eating, your movement, um, getting good sleep, managing your stress, nurturing your relationships. Those are the things that actually impact your health and can make a difference. And by doing those things, your weight may change. So if you are um, someone who is higher than your body's natural weight, because maybe you're not getting enough sleep or you are chronically overeating and not being very mindful of your hunger and fullness cues, or maybe you are I don't know, have a lot of stress in your life, and any of those factors. As you start to work on those things, then your weight might go down. Some people, when they start to do that stuff, their weight goes up because they're actually under what their natural weight is. Um, some people, their weight stays the same when they're making those healthy changes, but the health impacts are still there because weight and health are not the same thing. Okay, pause this. I have got the eggs all stirred up, and we're going to start getting... Ooh, I dropped my fork. We're into the eggs. We're going to start getting these vegetables into the egg mixture and we will continue this conversation. Um, so the next thing you might be thinking, potentially, let me scroll down and see if you've said anything in response to any of this yet before I start talking about da -da 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 -da. Okay, so how are relationships related to weight loss? So we're talking about health. So in terms of health, uh, our relationships, our communities, all those things are really important. And when people are isolated or when they don't have, you know, strong relationships, strong communities, it can impact your health physically. Um, humans are social creatures. We're meant to be around other people. And then also just in terms of having a support system. So if, you know, something bad happens at work, having that friend or that, you know, significant other or whatever that you can talk to and say, man, this is awful, this happened, to talk to, you know, about those things that happened. So emotional health, mental health, um, relationships impact that as well. Okay, so we've got the mushrooms in the bowl. Now we're putting in the roasted up onions and the butternut squash. Uh, so now you might be thinking, well, then why do people talk about weight so much? I thought BMI mattered. Um, all that kind of thing. Uh, the thing with weight and BMI is that one, BMI was not developed as a tool to like help us determine people's health. It was just basically for categorizing people. Some people are in this weight, some people are in that weight. Uh, let's look at this breakdown. But it's not like, oh, if you're at this weight, then suddenly you're unhealthy. Whereas if you were, you know, at this other weight, then your health's great because weight does not determine health. Again, it's about what you're actually doing. Um, so BMI is really helpful for looking at a group of people. So if we can look at, for instance, I live in the United States, if we look at the population of the United States and we look at BMI trends over 10 years, then we can see, oh, as a population, this, you know, is going up or this is going down or this is staying the same or whatever. But that's not really helpful for an individual because, let me wash my hands again. That's not really helpful for an individual because within a population, we have a variety of shapes and sizes. So just like a lot of nutrient needs are like this too, we all don't need exactly the same amount of vitamin C, for example. All those recommendations are based on averages. So when you look at a population, there are going to be some people, it's, you know, kind of like a bell curve. A lot of people kind of clump towards this kind of middle area. There are some people who are down on this end. There are some people who are down on this end. So we have this distribution. Um, so, and any individual could be at any spot on that. So when we look at something like weight or BMI, we can look at trends in a population, but we don't, we can't look at an individual and say, oh, you're naturally in the right in the middle of this bell curve, or you're naturally a little bit more towards this side or really far on this side. You're an outlier uh, one way or the other. We can't really do that. And so since we don't know that when we take and say everyone's weight needs to be right here in the middle or within this narrow range in the middle, 
we can't apply that to an individual because we don't know where they fall on that bell curve. And for some people, taking care of their bodies, engaging in healthy behaviors, all that kind of stuff, they're naturally going to be larger. Um, but, and we all know people who take good care of their bodies and are just in bigger bodies. We all know people who don't take very good care of their bodies. Maybe they, um, you know, aren't eating very well. They're not getting a good variety of foods. They're not engaging in joyful movement. They're not getting a good amount of sleep. They're not managing their stress. They don't have great relationships or strong relationships. And they fit in that kind of, you know, healthy weight range or whatever. Um, what people would say is a healthy weight range. So we gotta look at the big picture with this kind of stuff and everything that's going on and looking at the things that are actually impacting our health. So that's kind of the big overview with that. Um, and I think it's really important to keep that in mind because it has wide impacts. You know, uh, when we focus on weight, people who are larger are disincentivized to engage in healthy behaviors like go to the gym because there's all this attention on them or, you know, whatever. Or on the flip side, uh, people maybe who are thinner are disincentivized to go to the gym. It's like, well, I'm thin, so why am I going to exercise? Because it's not about health again, it's about weight and appearance. Um, also, larger people, when they go to the doctor, they could have an infection and the doctor's like, well, you know what, if you lost weight, you wouldn't get sick. It's like, okay, well, I needed like medication. <laughs> this is not relevant to this conversation. They're not getting the treatment they need. On the flip side, someone who's thin, maybe they never hear about healthy eating habits. They never are asked about their movement or their sleep. It's like, well, they're skinny, you know? So it, it hurts everyone. Um, and for me, I'm really about promoting health and helping people if they want to, um, you know, focus on their health or engage in healthy behaviors. That That's, you know, what I'm into. So now that I've been talking and talking and talking, I've mixed all this stuff together while I've been running my mouth. <laughs> um, I'm also going to put in a little bit more salt, and I see that a lot of you have said stuff, so I will scroll down and look at that in a second. But I do want to talk food real quick, so I'm going to put in a little bit of salt. I'm also going to put in a little bit of pepper. Um, I've just got the black pepper pepper grinder here. And let me get the cast iron. So I've got a gigantic cast iron skillet that's actually also linked in my store because that's another item I use all the time. So that link is in the description if you want to see uh, that one. But it's like a humongous. Um, so I've got the at... <clears throat> I need to get a drink of water. I've got the cast iron pan. I greased that up already. So you can use whatever kind of oil or cooking fat you want to use. Um, or if your pan is really well seasoned, you might not need any but mine is not uh, so it needs a little something extra to prevent this from sticking so I've heated that up on high heat uh, actually let's turn it down medium high heat and we're gonna let that get hot and then we're gonna pour this into the pan I should have been doing that when I was running my mouth but it'll heat up pretty quick so I'll answer some more of your questions um, Teresa Baker do you think being a chronic overeater is an eating disorder okay so there is such a thing as binge eating disorder that's very specific. Um, I don't know off the top of my head all the like diagnostic criteria, but that is a thing like a diagnosable eating disorder is binge eating disorder. You have to do, you know, certain frequency within a certain amount of time, all that kind of stuff to be diagnosed with that. But there is also disordered eating. So you might engage in disordered eating, but it might not be a diagnosable eating disorder. It hasn't gotten to that point, but it's still not a good thing. So chronic overeating, could be considered disordered eating um, because you're not kind of paying attention to your body and like what your body needs. Um, but it's hard to know without knowing more specifics and kind of the intentions behind it, what's going on. Is it because you're distracted when you're eating? Um, you know, is it, there could be a lot of factors that could cause that. So it could potentially be a form of disordered eating uh, and potentially be a di eating disorder if it's, you know, at a certain point. Um, with binge eating disorder. Um, ooh, okay, this is a fun question. Yasmin says, hi Sarah, do you listen to any nutrition podcasts? I was listening to Dishing Up on Nutrition on Spotify. I'm not so sure I agree with those dietitians' opinions. Well, I can't speak to that, sorry, I was just checking my battery. I can't speak to that specific podcast because I have not heard it, though maybe, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts, <laughs> but maybe I can look that one up and uh, listen to some of it. I do listen to some podcasts, um, nutrition podcasts. I kind of go through waves, though, because sometimes I'm like, this is interesting. I want to learn more from other people in my field and also hear how they're communicating about this stuff, how they're explaining things, because that can be really helpful. But other times I'm like, 
I think about food a lot. I want a podcast that's about tech or about movies or about religion or whatever, something not nutrition. Uh, but I do have a few uh, that I keep on my thing. Um, and you might like all these, you might like certain ones. I think a lot of it depends on what you're interested in, but also personality of the presenter. So I think that's something to keep in mind that, you know, if you watch my videos, you might think my information is helpful, but also you probably like the way I present it or you feel like we connect on some way. So podcasts are like that too. Um, so some of these might be good for you, some of them might not be, but um, let's see. Rebecca Scritchfield is a dietitian with a podcast called Body Kindness. She also has a book by the same name. So that's an example of one. Um, there is the Food Matters podcast. I wish I could look these up on my phone, but I'm filming on my phone. Food Matters with, um, no, Nutrition Matters. Nutrition Matters. That's with Paige Smathers, who's a dietitian. There is the Food Psych podcast, uh, by Chrissy Harrison. Um, I know I'm missing some. There is, those are the top three that are coming to mind right now. I'm sure I'm missing some. Maybe we could talk about podcasts more. If y'all have any that you recommend, let us know in the comments. I'm gonna think a little bit real quick and we're gonna pour this frittata into the pan. So the pan is hot and all of this stuff is going in. It might make a loud sizzling sound, so just a warning. All right, we're in the pan. I'm gonna get this bowl out of here. And I'm just gonna make sure all of this stuff is kind of spread out evenly so we don't have like a clump of mushrooms on one side and then no mushrooms on the other side or something, but it looks like it's pretty even. All right, now I'm gonna turn the heat. So the heat was at medium high. I'm gonna turn it down to uh, medium, medium low and we're gonna let this, the edges set, and then we're gonna finish it off in the oven uh, to get it cooked through. Um, yeah, there's another one, um, I'm trying to think, I feel like those are the main three, Body Kindness, Nutrition Matters, Food Psych. Those are all ones that are pretty good. I, I have a couple others I've recently started listening to, but I can't remember their names, and I also can't necessarily give them a full recommendation because I haven't listened to them that much. But those are three that I think are good. Teresa says, you look amazingly healthy. I'm trying to get all my nutrition from food instead of multivitamins. Uh, do you suggest a multivitamin? Well, thanks, though I would say, again, you can't tell how healthy I am by the way I look. So, <laughs> um, but I appreciate the compliment. And I understand the intention behind that and thank you. Um, but as far as multivitamins, I don't recommend a specific brand. Um, and I think it's good to strive to get a variety of nutrients from food, though sometimes you might need a supplement to help you with that, depending on you know what else you have going on or just in general. I don't have a particular brand that I recommend, but I would say you know you might need a special one depending on your needs. Uh, so definitely keep that in mind. Um, but I I don't have a a certain brand. You could also look up. Um, you know, if you can find some research or data on ones or like independent analysis, um, that could be helpful. Okay, Rye says, thank you for taking your time to answer my question. I completely agree. Since I'm concerned about my health, I changed my eating habits. That sounds good. And um, also I sometimes worry about not getting healthy by the time I go into the RD program. Ooh, yeah, that, you don't have to be healthy to be a dietitian. And I say that to mean that like, one, I think it's great to practice what you preach. You know, if I was telling y'all to make a frittata and then after this video was over, I threw it in the garbage, then that would not be like, okay. you know, I like, I think it's important for me to show you the food I'm really eating. And that includes ice cream and pizza and all that kind of stuff too. Um, but also like everyone has different things going on. And I think you'll find if you go into an RD program that there are a few things going on. One, there are lots of people who maybe have a medical condition that has nutrition related to it, um, and that's why they're interested in nutrition. Maybe they have type one diabetes, or maybe, and you know, they grew up with that. Maybe they saw an RD as a kid, and they're like, oh, that'd be such a cool job to have. Maybe they have a lot of food allergies or something like that. On the flip side, there's also a lot of people who go into it, and they're in a very disordered mindset. I was one of those people. Like, I'm here because I want to learn how to get skinny and like, you know, was doing all these weird things to my diet. Um, and there are a lot of people in that boat. And I think a lot of times eating disorders can kind of thrive in that environment and kind of this idea of orthorexia, concern with healthy eating where it becomes, you know, too much. Um, 
that's something that kind of thrives in that dietitian environment. It's like, oh, we're all into nutrition and we're learning about these things and we all love healthy eating and blah, 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 blah. Um, and it can kind of start to mask over maybe some underlying problems. So I wouldn't be concerned about being healthy. Um, I understand like wanting to like do the things that you want to advocate for, but also like everyone's on their own journey. Don't put pressure on yourself. You do you and understand that everyone's dealing with their own stuff, you know. Uh, but I do think that can definitely be a thing in that kind of environment that can actually cause some negative results. Disordered eating, eating disorders, that sort of thing. Um, okay. I, um, Eric Coleman says, hi, nice to talk to you. Hi, Eric. I'm glad you're enjoying the video. Teresa says, thank you. Uh, Yasmin says, about podcasts, true. I was specifically listening to one of the immune, on the immune system. They were saying something about not eating any sugar at all as it's lethal to antibodies. Yeah, that's that. based on that quote, that doesn't sound very helpful. Um, I'll, uh, I'll still look into it, but yeah, that's, that's not something I would say. I don't want to call out anyone else, but I'll say that's not something I would say, okay? And I don't think that's accurate either. Teresa says, I love cast iron skillets. I use mine all the time. Um, no try, no trouble with iron, definitely. Yeah, iron, uh, cooking cast iron can actually add some iron into your food. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, let me get another sip of water. So what's happening right now is this is just kind of setting up around the edges. Once this gets set, then we'll move on to the next step. Mm. Lauren says, concerning weight, I was wondering also, someone is supposed to be meeting me here at 6.30 for coming over tonight to work on something. So she just realized it's 6.30. So they might be coming in the door, but that's okay. Lauren Goes Hollywood says, concerning weight, I was wondering what you think about anorexia and diagnosing it in people who are at a certain weight. Do you think weight should be a criterion or do you think it's mostly behavior? Wait one second. Someone just pulled up. I don't want the kitties to get out. Um, Sorry, guys, I'm not trying to abandon you. They're going to come in the house and be like, why is she talking to her phone right now? Um, that's a, that's a good point. Right now, the criteria for anorexia is behaviors and weight. I, I'm not an eating disorder specialist, so I don't have a strong opinion on this as far as like, we should change the diagnosis. But I do think there needs to be room for, or like, or at least a recognition of that, um, that you can be at any weight and have an eating disorder. There's a lot of eating disorders that go undercover because people are not super thin. And that's um, in medical situations, but also just in friend situations where people don't realize that someone has an eating disorder. They're like, well, they're not super skinny. It's like, well, that's not really what it's about. It's about what you're doing. Um, so yeah, I'm doing a live stream making our dinner. So just so you know. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I don't know if they should change it or if we need broader awareness or broader diagnostic criteria, maybe a different diagnosis, but that's kind of what I think on that. Um, oh, Eric says, miss, I missed what you were cooking. Okay, so if you want to go back and watch the rest of the live stream on the replay, you can see what I'm doing. But right now we have a frittata in the pan so that has roasted mushrooms, roasted butternut squash, roasted red onion, um, salt, garlic powder, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we've got a salad on the side, so... I did this and then um, we're also I'll show you what we're gonna have next while we're waiting for this to finish so for starch we're gonna do this rosemary sourdough um, I've talked about this before in a couple of different videos I get this stuff at Wegmans and I think it is super tasty so that's what we're gonna do for that and then um, for the salad we're just gonna have like a balsamic vinaigrette I'm gonna make so now that the edges of this have kind of started to set up. We're going to put it under the broiler. I'm going to put it under the broiler on low. Oh, I forgot to add cheese. Y'all, I've been talking the whole time, and I could have been cooking. All right. This is a smoked cheddar from Trickling Springs Creamery. We're going to grate a little bit of this on the top. Um, and you, this is not required, so if you can't do lactose or dairy or you don't like cheese or whatever, that's fine. Uh, you could also use... This wants to crumble on me for whatever reason. You could also use any other cheese you like, really. You could do like a goat cheese. I've done that before. That would be good. Um, this smoked cheddar is really nice because it has that, you know, smoky flavor. So this, but it does not want to grate. It always wants to break into pieces and then it ends up being a little bit of a mess. But that's okay. Okay. 
I'm going to try to do a little bit more, and then we're going to call it good. All right, that's one there. Now, we're going to put this under the broiler, and this goes pretty fast, so you have to be careful that you don't burn it. Ugh. But, it takes, I don't know, probably about five minutes, so just don't let me get talking, and then um, forget to look at it. But, we're going to put that in there for now. Then I will check on it and show you what it looks like when it's done. Teresa says it looks good and that she's going to come over too. <laughs> um, Eric says, do you and Jason eat a lot of carbs? Um, we eat carbs. That's, that's all I can say, really. <laughs> um, I don't know what someone might consider a lot, but carbs are definitely a part of our life and a part of our meals. Um, and we are not low carb by any means. If you want my thoughts on like something specific like keto, I do have a video on that. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to press the air out of this bag. But for just a good guideline for any type of meal or snack, um, a good mix to have, generally speaking, and this is really helpful, I think, when you're doing your meal planning to think of, this, of, it, of it this way. You want some carbs, some fat, some protein, and some fiber. And those four things combine to give you a mixture of nutrients, a mixture of flavors and textures and all that kind of stuff. So if we want to think about this meal that way, um, protein, we're getting that from the eggs and the frittata. Um, there's also a little bit of protein in the cheese. If we want to think about fat, there's fat in the eggs, fat in the cheese. Uh, we also use some fat when we cook the vegetables, so that's in there. Uh, so we've got protein, fat, carbs. The veggies have some carbs, but not a lot, but that's mostly gonna be the sourdough. And then fiber, there's gonna be, oh, we're also, okay, so there's gonna be fiber with the lettuce, there's gonna be fiber in the veggies that were in the frittata, and then also the salad dressing will have some fat in it. So we've got carbs, we've got fat, we've got carbs, we've got fat, we've got protein, we've got fiber. Those are kind of the basics. And then you can do variations from there. So let's see. I'm going to check the frittata. I don't want it to burn while we were talking. No, it still looks fine. I'm probably checking it too much now, but I'm just worried that we're going to have the smoke alarm go off. And that would be embarrassing and also annoying for all of y'all. And let me know if you have any more comments or questions. This is kind of, we got to wait for this to finish up, and then I'll show you what the final product looks like. Um, and then, like I said, we're going to have the lettuce on the side, we're going to have the sourdough with it. And I'm going to make a dressing, which we can do right now, actually. I'll get a jar, and I'll show you all how to do that. And try not to drop anything. Um, okay, so, salad dressing. I like to do it in a mason jar because it's easy. This is also good if you have kids because they can help out with this. If you have small, I mean, big kids can help out with all kinds of stuff. But little kids can do this. So, we've got our jar. I'm going to put in a little bit of olive oil. We got that in there. And then I'm going to put in some vinegar. So this is kind of a basic vinaigrette recipe. Um, it's really easy to do and you can adjust it to fit what you want. So we're going to use balsamic vinegar. You could use rice vinegar, or not rice vinegar, that probably wouldn't be great. You could use red wine vinegar. You could use champagne vinegar. You could use apple cider vinegar, whatever. It doesn't matter. We're using balsamic vinegar. So I do about 50-50. Some people go a little more towards the vinegar or a little more towards the oil. It doesn't matter, just whatever you like. Um, and then we're gonna put in some mustard. And mustard, the Dijon mustard helps because it acts as an emulsifier. So that helps to keep, if I can get any to come out, that helps to keep the, um, the oil and the vinegar from separating as much when you mix it together. You could add other things into this. You could add like a little maple syrup or honey or some sort of like raspberry jam. That would be good. You could add in herbs or spices if you want to do that. This is kind of the basic. You put on your lid and give it a nice shake. And so this is great if you have little ones that want to help you with your cooking. Get them to do this. Like what little kid doesn't want to shake up a jar of stuff? I think it's fun. And then they'll be like, oh, it's all mixed together. I don't know. I think it's a fun thing. Um, ju -ju 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 -ju. 
Oh, okay. Teresa is asking about fats. What types of fats are the best? Um, Teresa likes olive oil, avocados, eggs. I like all of those too. Um, nuts and seeds are great. Um, and y'all see, I cook with all kinds of stuff. We cook with butter, we cook with lard. If I have bacon fat, I'll cook with that. Um, so I kind of use everything. Oh crap, I need to be checking this. See, I told you I was gonna start talking and then it's gonna get burned. Oh, it's still fine. Okay, we'll let it keep going. So that's the dressing and then we'll just pour that over. And like I said, that's a very basic vinaigrette recipe. Anyone can make it. Um, creamy dressings, I don't make like, creamy dressings as much or really at all because it's a little bit more work though it's something I want to play with a little bit more I like to do yogurt as a base for dressings if I'm gonna do a creamy dressings it's something I always have on hand Miss Luna is here to say hello this is our most rambunctious kitty she's the one who wants to climb on everything see she wants to get to now she's like I got adventures to have put me down um Rye asks, how long does the dressing last in the fridge? I usually leave it out on the counter because when you put it in the fridge, some of the fats in the olive oil will start to solidify and it kind of gets weird. And all this stuff is fine to have at room temperature, um, I guess. But we usually don't keep it that long. I usually make a small amount and then we'll just use it like tonight and then tomorrow for leftovers and then that'll be the whole thing. Um, so it usually doesn't hang around very long. Though Jason did mention here lately, he was like, why don't you just make a big jar of it and we could just have it. And I was like, I don't know, I just kind of make however much we need. Um, so, that's that. Um, Teresa says, black cats are good luck. Yes, Luna is so precious and adorable and black cats get such a bad rap. People think they're bad luck and all this stuff and they are the best. All right, I'm gonna check this frittata again. Cause I have burned it before. I'm not gonna do it today, but it has happened. And, uh, it's not pretty. All right, we're gonna turn the broiler up to high. Now we're getting we're we're getting real dangerous. I'm gonna turn it up to high <laughs> to see if it'll finish it, and hopefully I don't burn it. Uh, but there definitely, I there's only one time I burn it really bad where we had to cut off the like top layer because it was not edible. Typically it's just a little extra crispy, and most of the time it turns out fine, you know. But sometimes it's a little a little more than I would like. And as far as y'all are asking about what goes into a meal and what kind of stuff should you have, um, you know, more specifics on that as far as why each thing is important. Uh, the carbs are important because that gives you quick energy now. Uh, the fat is important, one, because fat is an essential nutrient all on its own, but also fat helps you feel fuller for longer. It also helps with the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins. So vitamin A, D, E, and K are all fat-soluble. So you need fat to absorb those. So if you're just putting vinegar or lemon juice on your salad, I hate to break it to you, but a lot of the vitamins in there are not getting absorbed. They're just going right through. So uh, fat's important for that. Um, and then also, fat is important because it does help us be just satisfied with our meals that's why if you eat um, something like if you just ate some pretzels you might feel full initially but then you get hungry really quick because you don't have that fat or protein to help keep it kind of going long term on the flip side if you just eat like guacamole and nothing else which i do sometimes but usually you feel kind of like Bleh because I mean I guess I eat it with chips so even that's not alone I'm getting some carbs from the chips but um, you need that mixture and the protein helps with repairing stuff around your body building cells and organs and muscles and all that kind of stuff fiber helps with good digestion and feeling satisfied and full so they all have a little role to play and that's why it's important to have that mixture Teresa says oven check thank you oh no oh no Oh, Teresa, it's perfect. Good work. Look at that. Boom. So, you know, it's like golden brown on top. It looks very pretty. Thank you, Teresa, for not letting me burn the frittata. So, I saw there was one more question from Lauren. Lauren asked, does Jason never cook? Not really. Not because for any reason other than I went to school for this, I guess. Though I do see a lot of dietitians whose husbands do cook a lot, but it's not Jason's thing and I like doing it. Not so, that I can't, let's not Yeah, it's not that Jason, here. no, I would say you're not as skilled as I am. Is well, I mean, fair? I don't know if I, maybe. 
<laughs> it does. It does take me like twice as long to make things. Right, because you're not as well practiced. But like roasting up some vegetables with some chicken breasts. You can do that. He did eggs, that a lot in college. Yeah. French toast. Mmm. Yeah. Got it. You got it. So, but I do most of the cooking because it's just kind of my thing. But you know, a different distribution of responsibilities would also be fun. Okay. Um. Nita says, if all dietitians go to school and learn the same information, how is it that they later on teach something different from each other on the same topic, such as sugar, no salt, no fat, fat, blah, 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 blah. Okay, um, that's a good question. Well, first off, a lot of people you're getting nutrition information from are dietitians. Like, a lot of people that talk about food stuff, they didn't go to school for this, so they just kind of make it up or parrot other things that they've heard, or they tried it and it works, so that means it works for everyone, right? Um, so that's part of the problem. Also, another part of it is because nutrition is a young science, things are shifting, but not as much, I think, as you would think based on the way things are reported in the media. Um, so I think those are kind of the big differences, is there is some wiggle, some professional opinion and expertise going on. And also a lot of this stuff, as far as the basics of nutrition have not changed, despite like sensational headlines that make it sound like they are. It's like, eat a variety of food, don't really cut anything out, whatever. But you know what? A lot of the times the people that you hear the most, so that's what most dietitians are saying, but the people that you hear the most from are the ones who are screaming at the top of their lungs and who are saying something either extreme or sensational or contrarian or whatever. So those are the people who get the attention, and then it seems like, man, these people can't agree on anything. Whereas I would say most dietitians agree on most things. Um, but, you know, the people who don't, or who are very vocal, you see them, they're usually, you know, have a book or, you know, two or whatever because they're saying something different from everyone else. So that's kind of how that works. Um, and then as far as like the anti-diet thing, that is a newer thing as far as research and our understanding and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think that's not some, I didn't learn to promote diets in school, but I also didn't learn a lot about anti-diet stuff. It was just kind of part of it. Um, so I think that is, a factor as well for that specifically. Okay, so we see the frittata back here. Looks delicious. Just a reminder, everything we're having, so you can get the full picture, we're gonna have this lettuce that I chopped up. We washed, really simple veggie to have on the side. Um, we made our dressing, okay? And then we have got our rosemary sourdough, which I'm just gonna slice, and then we're gonna put in the toaster. Um, Nita asks, is brown rice better than white? It does have more fiber and some more nutrients, but also like if you go to a restaurant and have what, they have white rice, not a big deal, not something to stress out over. Oh, Nita says that Jason should cook on a live stream, and Lauren says that she agrees next live stream should be Jason cooking. I don't know if we can arrange that, but I will. Yeah. He says he'd be down, so maybe we can organize that. I don't know about next month. We'll have to look at the schedule, but that's something I'll keep in mind for a future live stream because I think that's a great idea, and I think it sounds a lot of fun. But with all that said, I'm gonna get all this sliced up and plated up and we're gonna eat, um, but I hope you are having a great day, great morning, evening, afternoon, whatever, wherever you are. I really enjoy getting on these live streams and talking with you guys. Um, it's a lot of fun and I hope that you get something out of it as far as entertainment or you learn something or whatever. Rye says thanks for the video, bon appetit. Thank you very much. It was great talking to all of you um, and I will see you very soon in my next video. Bye.